Welcome to Session 8, Mark of the Beast Revealed. This is one of those titles that it's like, I gotta catch that one. But if there's, I know there's nobody in the room who's missed the previous session, but if there's anybody catching the video after the fact and you haven't watched Session 7 and 6 and 5, this is kind of part four of a four-part mini-series within our full series. Five, six, seven, and eight here. Session five was the identity of the beast power. You'd better not identify the beast's mark if you don't know who the beast is, because you're going to get all messed up on this question. And then the two previous nights also are very important as a lead into this message. So having said that, let's of course begin with prayer. But you realize when you read Revelation that this mark is the last stage. It's the last act in the prophetic drama that precedes Christ's second coming. So it's not, we're not in the Mark of the Beast crisis yet. There's not a no buy, no sell, death decree scenario, but we're going to read about those dramatic periods that are soon to come in God's word. And I really want to pray before we do that, because that, it, it, can, it can be troubling to people when, we, when our hearts fail ourselves for fear of what is coming upon the earth. Jesus said that that would happen. But you know what also he said to the, to the believers? He says, when you see the signs of the times happening, lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. You can turn to Revelation 13. We're going to study the first 10 verses of Revelation 13 and identify the Vatican's mark, the Roman church's mark, the beast's mark tonight. I think it's good to phrase it that from, way from time to time. The beast's mark. Sometimes we look at mark of the beast as this one word thing and you forget that it's actually the mark that is of the, the beast power, the little horn power, which we're going to see again in Revelation 13, is going to fit that fulfillment as uh, papal Rome, the papacy. But let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the privilege to open your word and to seek your truth. We want to be warned about that coming Mark of the Beast crisis, but even more so we want to understand what is your seal? What is the seal of God and how can we know that we are receiving it and growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Revelation 13, verses 1 through 10. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rising up out of the sea. John sees this in vision, and you know Revelation is a symbolic book. He sees a beast rising from the sea. What does a beast represent in Bible prophecy from Daniel 7 from our study three nights ago? A kingdom, a political power. Daniel 7, 23, if you want the reference on that, it's also Daniel 7, verse 17. The beast, the four beasts represented four kingdoms. So he now sees this beast rising up out of the sea. Do you want to know what the sea represents in the Bible? Just jump right over to 17, verse 5, 15 rather, 17, verse 15. It says the the sea or the waters which you saw are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So the sea in, repre in Revelation represents a densely populated place where there's lots of people and nations and multitudes and tongues. So a, an, a political entity of some kind is going to arise where there's a lot of people. Keep in mind where there was a lot of people over the last 2,000 years, you know, in the past. And this beast has seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the names of blasphemy. Did you hear tens there? Is this sounding like a little bit of an echo of Daniel 7? And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. Do you recognize those three? And then the ten? So this is sounding like a composite beast of the totality of Daniel 7, the four kingdoms. This is the culmination of the political powers of the imperial past fulfilling them all. And this beast which I saw, rather let's go to the end of verse 2, the dragon gave this beast his power and his seat and his great authority. We've referred to the Antichrist beast as this front man that the devil has put out to receive the worship that he seeks for himself. It's the devil that gave him his power and seat and great authority. 
And I saw one of his heads as if it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. We're going to come back to that another night. And all the world wondered after the beast. It's as if the whole world is deceived by this entity. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. That's almost word for word from Daniel 7, isn't it? That little horn with a mouth speaking pompous words. This beast was given a mouth speaking blasphemies. That's the second time blasphemy was mentioned. Verse, verse 13, blasphemy. Verse, verse 1 of chapter 13, blasphemy at the end of the verse. Verse 5, great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue. And here's the dead giveaway. How do you know the little horn and the beast's power of Revelation 13 are one and the same? The exact same time period that they rule for. 42 months. Verse 6, he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. That piece about the tabernacle is important because we understand a truth that we studied from Daniel 8, 14 about something important that is happening in the heavenly tabernacle or temple. And this power would deny that truth and cast truth to the ground as it says in Daniel 8. Verse 7, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, there is another identifier, the same from Daniel 7, persecuting the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship. There's the third mention of worship in this section. Worship him whose names are not written in the book of, the li of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. And then I alluded to this, I mentioned this, but this is such a key text that you haven't seen yet, we haven't seen yet together. It says, he that leadeth into captivity, in other words, this power that was persecuting the saints, he had taken so many people captive, he had killed so many with the sword, he himself shall go into captivity. And do you remember when in your historical timeline the Pope was taken captive by Napoleon's general Berthier during the Napoleonic Wars, 1798, pinpointing exactly on that timeline the 1,260-year mark from when the papacy was founded in 538 A.D. And by founded, we don't mean that there wasn't a bishop of Rome before 538. We just recognize that 538 was when the bishop of Rome was given that decretal authority by the emperor Justinian that you are the supreme bishop of bishops. And the three barbarian tribes that were threatening the power of the papacy were subdued that same year, 538. So the Bishop of Rome became truly the Pope as we know him in 538. 1,260 years from that was 1798, and there you had it, the, ver end of, uh, the end of this section on the beast ends in verse 10 with him being led into captivity, literally what transpired in history. Now please jump over to Revelation 14, and I want to read 9 and 10, but I also want to read um, a little bit more in 14. Uh, let's start with the three angels' messages in verse 6. John saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. And we've seen this one. This is the first angel's message, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. We studied that, the heavenly judgment, the pre-advent judgment began in heaven in 1844 as a fulfillment of the annual Day of Atonement. And then he quotes from the fourth commandment and shows that this controversy between the beast and between the lamb is about worship. It says, worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Now, in verse 8, there follows a second angel. We're not going to study the second angel's message tonight. We'll come back to him the next, uh, in a few nights from now next week. Well, he says Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. 
because she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. We'll identify Babylon later, but here we are for the third angel's message right now to look at the mark of the beast. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. These are serious warning words, are they not? This is one of the most sober texts in the entire Bible. The third angel's message simply saying, don't take the mark of the beast. Don't receive the mark of the beast. Don't worship the dragon, the beast through the dragon, the dragon through the beast. And there's only one way to make sure that we are not following the beast's mark, and that is to follow God's seal. Do you see something placed on the foreheads of believers at the beginning of Revelation 14? I closed my Bible, but you'll see 144,000 on Mount Zion with their father's name in their forehead. So you could entitle this message how to receive the seal of God. That is probably a better title. Everybody out there in prophetic interest is talking about the mark of the beast. What is the mark of the beast? So, you know, for marketing, you call it the, the mark of the beast and people go, I want to learn about that. But actually, you know what you're going to learn about tonight? We're going to talk about the seal of God more than we're going to talk about the mark of the beast. Now, can we do something first before we talk about the mark of the beast? In verse 18, it says, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. There is actually some confusion out there that 666 is the mark of the beast. It, that's not what the Bible says. It says it is the number of the beast. So when we get to the mark of the beast or the beast's mark, that's going to be a different thing altogether than the number. Now, it is kind of interesting, this number of the beast thing. It says it's the number of a man. Now, do you remember in Daniel 7, the little horn had a, a man's face and mouth on it? So you, you consider this power, this little horn or beast power, to be one with a prominent man at its head. And it says specifically that the number of the beast is the number of a man. Well, you know there's a certain man that rules this system called the Pope of Rome, and he has a certain title that is in Latin. You know everything in the Roman church historically was Latin. And one of his titles is Vicarius Filii Dei, or Vicar of the Son of God, or literally I'm not making this up or exaggerating this or using any sort of rhetorical twist. This is the literal rendering of this Latin term, the one who stands in the place of the Son of God. So that's enough right there, isn't it? I mean, we don't need to do the interesting math thing next to go, oh, that's a strange coincidence. But if you take the Roman numeral values of each of the letters in this famous title of the Pope, it adds up to 666. Now, on its own, that's not going to be the biggest news in the world because maybe your name adds up to 666 and that doesn't make you the Antichrist. But um, taken together with everything else we've seen, to plaster on the uh, titles of the Pope, the one who stands in the place of the Son of God, and you might remember that is, the, of course, the very definition. We'll get to it. I lost the slide on that, but oh, here it is. You remember this one, I'm jumping ahead. The definition of Antichrist in the Greek is one who puts himself in the place of Christ. So vicarious filii day, it would not be an exaggeration to say this is, could be roughly translated as Antichrist. Now you're aware Satan wants the authority, the obedience, the worship of all mankind. Did you know Romans 16 says that those who we offer ourselves to obey we are worshiping. Did you know obedience and worship are tied hand in glove? You are serving or worshiping the one that you are obeying. If we obey God, that is the rendering of the highest form of worship. So if Satan wants worship, do you think he's going to run around with a forked tail and a pitchfork and evil, you know, devil horns and hoofs and be like, hi. I am Satan. Worship me. 
I mean, we saw a few people will fall for the Baphomet statue because they just want to be cutting edge and rebellious and evil and anti-Christian. But that's only going to attract a small section of deviance in society. The, the masses will need to be tricked. So how does he do it? Well, we've seen this. Let's look at it again. It's Paul's Antichrist text about the lawless one. He says, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away or the apostasy comes first, and the man of sin, or the Antichrist, is revealed. The son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God. Now, before we get to that part, go back to son of perdition. This was mentioned a few nights ago, but it bears repeating with the proper textual support. John 17, verse 12, if you're taking notes, John 17, verse 12, is the only place that I know of where it refers to the son of perdition in the Bible. Here it says Antichrist will be like the son of perdition. Who was identified in John 17, 12 as being the son of perdition? Do you remember? Judas. Judas. So the Antichrist's power will be in the midst of the disciples of God, the people of God. He's going to have that son of perdition type of position. And then more to the point, he's going to sit as God in the temple of God. He wanted the position of God, didn't he? I will ascend. I will be above the other angels. I will be like the most high. Satan did. He never took that position. He was cast down to the earth. He deceives the whole world, and now he's got the Antichrist front man to receive the worship, to sit in the position of God. But what, this thing about the temple needs, some, needs a little bit of extrapolation. There's a lot of confusion today about the temple. What is the temple in the New Testament? Simply put, now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy what? Temple. temple. You are growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Did you know that the Jewish temple was torn down in 70 AD? It was destroyed. The city was leveled and burned. And since then, the, the recognition biblically for the Christian church has been that the, the only temple that counts is the heavenly sanctuary and the people of God being the temple of God. There isn't a New Testament text saying, look to Jerusalem for the rebuilding of a physical temple. Now, so much could be said on this right now, but I have to punt to my YouTube channel again because in a condensed series, we don't have the full message on what is the real Israel. And so I'll give you those four titles right there. And for those watching on the video, I believe the links will be posted in the description or something like that. Uh, the truth about the temple in Bible prophecy this includes a, uh, an information about the heavenly sanctuary and also about what the temple is and what the temple is not. And then in the second one there, Antichrist will arise in the temple. That's where we talk about what is the temple in the New Testament. And then Bible, these two are related, aren't specifically about the temple per se, but they're about all of that kind of collection of deceptions orbiting around the state of Israel. And it's called Bible Proof, the Kingdom of God was taken from Israel 2,000 years ago. I realize that that's a provocative title. And when you actually watch the video, you realize anybody from any religion background or ethnic background can be saved through the blood of Jesus Christ, especially Jews who were his precious chosen people for thousands of years prior. But, uh, and then the last one, the Bible Truth about Israel, what you need to know. So if you watch those four videos, you'll get a pretty good uh, Bible study on the Israel and temple topic. But this verse that we were looking at here, let's just go right back to it, shows that the Antichrist will arise in the temple of God. Now, the, the confusion about that is people are looking to a physical temple, and the Antichrist isn't going to arise until a physical temple is being rebuilt. So you can see where the deception comes in. It's the same variety of deception as 
Antichrist couldn't possibly be here yet because the rapture hasn't happened and seven years of life on earth didn't continue after the Christians were taken out of here and their clothes and their airplanes left unmanned and cars going off into the ditch. You know the scenario of the left behind. That didn't happen yet. Antichrist doesn't arrive till after that. So people are not seeing who that real biblical little horn beast power is. He's going to come in the temple of God and we understand that to be the, the church, right? You. So watch out, the Bible says, for the Antichrist to arise from within the church. Now, this is all precedent for understanding what his mark is because it's laying that groundwork again as, as to who the, who the beast's power is and who he is not. This idea, showing himself that he is God, we saw this quote, we hold this place, or we hold upon this earth, the place of God Almighty. That's an encyclical uh, ex-cathedra statement from the, the Pope himself. The supreme teacher requires complete submission and obedience of the will to the church and to the Roman pontiff as to God himself. That would be called worship. Complete submission and obedience of the will. Per Romans 6 verse 16, that is worship. Uh, as to God himself, it's like you got to rub it in there a little bit, don't you? Unbelievable. We're going to move on from that. We've seen those quotes. But you want to see something kind of cool? There's a lot in the, in the prophecies about the Antichrist, but there's also a lot about Christ. Um, the, the, Revel the book of Revelation is actually the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the full opening line in the book, the first words of the book. And he's pictured as the lamb in Revelation, and then the Antichrist as the beast, and you, you find the beast is kind of looking like he's trying to be the, the, the twin of Jesus Christ, the, uh, the counterfeit of Jesus Christ. Did Jesus not come out of the water at his baptism? And didn't we just read the beast came out of the water? How about that three and a half year period of time? 1,260 days prophetically, but Jesus had a ministry for literally three and a half years. Isn't that interesting? Both receive a deadly wound. We're going to study the Antichrist's deadly wound later, but you know Jesus received a deadly wound, came back to life, and you'll see that with the, with the beast's power as well, that one of his deadly wounds, heads had been wounded mortally, and, is, and then it was healed. Fifth, they both receive worship and honor, and they both seek to lead all the world. So this is underscoring again the point that Antichrist isn't, trying to look diabolical and the opposite of Jesus Christ. He's trying to mimic him. He's trying to counterfeit him. He's within the church. He's, he's within the, uh, the temple of God and is that son of perdition figure, that Antichrist, the one who is in the place of Christ. How about Antichrist? We haven't even looked at the text that uses this term yet. This far into the series, shame on me, but this is where we get the word Antichrist from. We've, we've thrown that around and we've only seen the texts that call him man of sin, lawless one, beast, and little horn. Well, here he's referred to as Antichrist. Let's read it together. In verse 18, little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists. So you might call that like lowercase a Antichrist, you know, the miniature versions, the, the, the prequel to the big guy. And he says, that's how we know that it's the last time or the last days. We're, we're heading into the last days here when the Antichrist comes up. They went out from us. So he's speaking of Antichrist here, the Antichrist spirit of the time, that they were the ones that went out from us. So they were of the Christian community. But they were never really of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out. It's the apostasy, the falling away. Paul calls it in 2 Thessalonians 2. Verse 20, But you have unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar? But he that, notice these words, in the context of talking about Antichrist, he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he is Antichrist. He who denies that Jesus is the Christ is Antichrist. Jump to verse chapter 4, and you're going to see how this power actually denies Jesus Christ. You might be like, what are you talking about? They've got him up on their statues. He's everywhere. Watch this. 1 John 4, 
verses 1 through 3. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is, what are the next few words there? Come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. That is the spirit of Antichrist. So the spirit of Antichrist will not teach that Jesus came in the flesh. Have you ever heard of the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception? There was a school nearby where I grew up, and it had this Immaculate Conception type of language to the name of the school. And I always assumed that the Immaculate Conception within Romanism was a reference to the conception of Jesus Christ in an immaculate way in his mother Mary's womb. That's what you'd assume. That's what the Bible teaches. I mean, he was. He was created by God. The Spirit of God came upon her and miraculously put the, the, the Son of God into that, into that womb. It's an amazing thing. That's what it ought to mean. You know what they really mean by it? Mary's. And that Mary was conceived immaculately. What? Now, I know. First time I heard that, that was my exact response. You look that up. The immaculate conception of Mary. I got Dr. Tim's nodding. He's, he's giving the thumbs up. She's like, what? I know. You're mind boggled by that because how could it be? She was a mere mortal. Now, here's the thing. We understand that Mary as godly and wonderful of a woman as she was, she was subject to the frailties and sins of, of human nature. And as such, when Jesus was born of her, he was a unique being in all of creation history because he was born of a fallen mother and parented also miraculously by the Holy Spirit by a perfect father, if you will. Roman Catholicism teaches that Mary was immaculate. Does that tell you maybe Jesus didn't really come in the flesh as he would have if he was truly born of a regular Mary? They've elevated Mary to queen of heaven, to the mediatrix, co-mediatrix. My Bible says there is no mediator, one mediator, no but Jesus between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. And I'm not trying to be you know, mad at, at my Catholic friends and stuff right now, but if it's, if it's deception, John used some strong language about that. It's a lie, and it is antichrist. My Catholic friends aren't antichrist. But this teaching is diabolical because it takes away the very nature of Christ, that he came in the flesh, and in Hebrews 4 and in Hebrews 2, he was tempted in all ways just as we are, yet was without sin. That's why his victory over sin matters. Oh man, there's a whole sermon in that. Let's go to Revelation. You're, you're ready for the mark of the beast, aren't you? That was awesome. Tail end additional bonus information about the Antichrist power because you can't fit it all in one. But um, here we go to Mark of the Beast Central in Revelation 13, verse 16. And he causeth all. So the, this is the beast. This is actually a second beast we're going to study later. But he's going to cause everybody, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Now, did you notice the word cause? When the devil or one of his beastly powers wants to get something done, how do they cause it to happen? Is it through invitation, persuasion? Come now, let us reason together. Is it through loving entreaty? Is it through... Is it through logic? No, it's not through free will. That's God's way. Choose ye this day. Look at my loving character, and do you want to love and trust me back and choose me? Satan's not going to win on that front, because who's going to love and trust him the way he behaves? So he has to engage in, well, the first method would be deception. You know, he's the father of lies. So if he's going to cause people to do something, the first way is through deception. But when that doesn't work, he will always resort, resort to coercion, mandates, force, domination, conquest. He was a murderer from the beginning. So that's the two things most clearly stated about his character. He was a father of lies and a murderer from the beginning. Jesus says both in John 8. Herod 
is the perfect example of this. You remember King Herod at the time when Jesus was born, that Herod. He's alluded to in Revelation 12. When we study that, uh, you're going to see Herod alluded to and personified as the dragon, as Satan. And Herod, when Jesus was born, said to the Magi, you go and find out where this king was born, and then come and tell me, because I too want to worship him. Deception. And deception, just like Antichrist, claiming to worship Jesus. Oh man, isn't that something? But what did Herod do when the Magi got word they shouldn't go back to Herod? Herod said, kill them all. And he became bloodthirsty, evil, and diabolically dark in his murder of those infant children, two years old and under. Those are Satan's methods. Now let's read about it specifically in Revelation 13. He's going to cause them this way. And let's read the last part of verse 15. He's going to cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast, we'll talk about the image of the beast later, should be what? Killed. Killed. You're either worshiping his system or there's going to be a death decree. Verse 17, and that no man might buy or sell, say, save he that had the mark. Do you hear two different ways of coercion there? He starts with deception, then he goes to financial sanctions, no buy, no sell, and death decree, just like Satan's always done throughout history. Now, this all is going to look Christian, though. Remember this theme about Antichrist. This is all going to look and sound so virtuous. The virtue of this will be signaled beyond anything ever before seen in the history of virtue signaling. It's going to be, this is good for the nation. We're taking America back for God. It's for the environment. It's for the green agendas. Well, they won't say the word agendas. How would you put that in more propagandistic terms? It's for justice. It's for morality. Pick your term. I mean, you know the propaganda. If you're not hip to the propaganda techniques now, Listen in, get clued in, and don't buy everything you hear in the media because those are the kinds of things this whole thing is going to be wrapped in. And we want to be awake and aware before that happens. But here's a question. Aside from the fact that this system is enforcing a false worship of some kind, what else is wrong about it? Let me ask it this way. If... Christian believers, and, and those of us who understand the, the God's law the way we understand it, if we were to say, we're going to gather enough power with the government to enforce everything we know to be true from the Bible upon the nation, would that be appropriate to do? It would not. It's, you can't force worship. That's how Satan operates. God doesn't even force worship. How much more should I disclaim such a notion? And never, God forbid, would we do such a thing. So Revelation 13, verses 15 to 17, which we just read, tells us two things. Worship of the beast through the acceptance of his mark, which will soon be identified here, is going to be mandated. Worship of the beast through the acceptance of his mark will be mandated. Secondly, those who refuse to worship the beast by accepting his mark will be punished. And there are two ways that that punishment and pressure comes down. Financial, no commerce, and a death decree. So, is this clear so far? We're getting a little warmer now as to understanding what the mark of the beast may be because we see it's involving worship. Now, you already knew that because you heard worship, worship, worship in the first 10 verses, threefold repeated. And you also see it in Revelation 14, the first angel's message says, well, worship God. We're going to come back to that. But let's look just at the death decree for a moment. You can imagine different scenarios, futuristic, present, historical, on how death decrees are carried out. I don't mean to get graphic. This is taking us to a point of what the mark of the beast is not. But... There are guillotines, there are firing squads, there's mob justice, there's bombings, there's uh, imprisonment, electric chair, lots of methods, maybe a bullet in the forehead. Now, 
hang on to that, that thought right there that perhaps the death decree could be enforced through a bullet in the forehead. How about no commerce? You can imagine different scenarios of how this could be applied. Maybe we're under a high-tech, super-tech future of CBDC, central bank digital currencies. Cash is done away with people. Turn off your ability to buy and sell, and people are getting debanked already. And So that high-tech version. Or maybe you're imagining we're in sort of a Stone Ages type of you know, grid down situation and it's like punch cards and you go and get your punch card at the local, you know, center for uh, feeding everybody. And maybe it's some sort of super high tech technology where, where there are microchips implanted in human beings and in those microchips is all of our financial data. So who knows what it will look like, but the distinction that most people miss here, and the reason I'm bringing up these different methods of death decree and different methods of, um, of, of no buy, no sell enforcement, no buy, no sell enforcement might be a, a chip in your hand. A death decree might be a bullet in your forehead. But does that make the bullet the mark of the beast? And does that make the chip the mark of the beast? No, there's, there's, there are two things we're talking about simultaneously here. There's a method of prohibiting buying and selling and a method of enforcing a death decree. And then over here, there's this thing called the beast's mark. We still have to identify. But people conflate the two. And they go, the mark of the beast is a chip. Now, that's a problem because I've had a chip in my right hand for some time since they put the chips on the Visa credit cards. I'm like, oh boy, am I in trouble here? Well, no, Visa is not the papacy's mark, right? So let's not get kind of weird and, and, and fanatical and superstitious about these kind of things. And even an, an elderly person with dementia, they wander off, you know? It's like you, you, you chip your pet, and maybe some people are a little weirded out by that, but that precious elderly lady has not taken the mark of the beast, right? I mean, it's medical information on a chip. And I'm not a big fan of the technology personally, and Neuralink kind of creeps me out, quite honestly. But that's a whole separate discussion than the mark of the beast discussion, right? So think about this. Um, the mark of the beast crisis is the final and great culmination of the age-old battle between Christ and Satan that has gone on for 6,000 years. Satan's goal was to be like the Most High in the position of God to receive worship and obedience. That's what it's all about. It's his whole agenda. And this Mark of the Beast crisis is the final culmination of him trying to get everybody to obey his worship system. And this final culmination is going to show the distinction between who is saved and lost who loves Jesus, who is willing to compromise and not worship God's, God, God's way. This distinction between the seal of God and the mark of the beast is a spiritual assessment testing our loyalty to God. It answers the question that appears over and over again, whom will we worship and whom will we obey? That is the question at stake, not how much technological invasion into our lives we accept. Do you follow? That's an important discussion. I have a whole series on that called technocracy, by the way. So if any of you have been exposed to that, you're like, okay, Brother Scott, I believe you when you say you're not a fan of the metaverse and Klaus Schwab talking about brain chips and everybody reading everybody else's thoughts. And yeah, that's a whole other lecture. But the mark of the beast is not going to come down to how much technology people are accepting. Now, those technologies can be used to enforce the beast's mark and maybe even enforce the death, death decree. But let's remove those two discussions. The enforcement method is a separate discussion from what is the mark. Is that clear? All right, let's go forward now. <clears throat> I'm going to identify the beast's mark here. Uh, we saw this already, just to review. Worship, worship, worship. If you want the three verses on that, three, four, and eight. Threefold repetition. Contrast that with, now this is really cool. We, we, uh, we looked at Revelation 14, the three angels' messages. It says this. So, so Revelation 13 says, worship the beast, worship the dragon, worship the beast. Revelation 14 says, worship God who made heaven, the earth, the sea. Don't worship the beast. In verse 9. And then keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Are, are, you, are you catching what John is laying out here, the threefold repetition? Let, let's do that again. The Antichrist receives worship, worship, worship. God warns us to avoid that worship by worshiping God, who made heaven, the earth, and the sea. Don't take the beast's mark in verse 9, but keep the commandments of God. 
we're getting a little warmer here now, aren't we? Um, it's about authority, isn't it? Satan wanted the position of God. He's the lawless one. The Antichrist is the lawless one. God says, commandments, commandments, commandments. Answer the lawless, lawless, lawless one. So now the easiest way it's going to be for us to identify the beast mark is simply to understand what the seal of God is, which is very simple. And I know we could have started with this, and I could have had you guys out in 10 minutes tonight, but there's a lot of things you try to weave in because identifying the seal of God and the mark of the beast really doesn't take that much. But then after we identify it, let's think about the, uh, also the outplay of this. What does this world look like where this is going to happen? But, okay, how do I identify it? Go to Revelation 7, verses 1 through 3. This is where the seal of God is stated. Um, you're going to see where it's placed and how this is the... How, how the mark of the beast is the counterpart to God's seal. Uh, when you're reading through Revelation, you don't hear mark of the beast till Revelation 13, but you hear seal of God in Revelation 7. That's why I say it should be called, tonight's message should be called receiving the seal of God. It's introduced earlier in the book. So you read about God's seal here, and then later you read about the beast's mark. After these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the, do you see the word? Mm -hmm. Seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God, where? In their foreheads. In Revelation 14, where God is saying, don't take the beast's mark, they have the name of God written in their foreheads. The seal of God, the name of God in the forehead of the believers. By the way, does this also underscore the idea that the mark of the beast is not a chip in your forehead because the seal of God is not like a holy chip in your forehead that Satan is putting a bad chip. It's not about chips in literal things. Revelation is a symbolic book. So what is placed in our foreheads biblically? Turn to Deuteronomy 6. We could guess what's placed in our forehead or we can just say, let's go straight from the Bible. What does the Bible say gets placed in the forehead? Revelation, or sorry, Deuteron Deuteronomy 6, verses 1 through 8. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that ye might do them in the land whether you go to possess it that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words, which I command thee this day, by the way, what's in Deuteronomy 5? Ten the Ten Commandments. Yeah. So these words, which I command thee this day, the Ten Commandments, shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them, bind what? the commandments, bind the Ten Commandments for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. The hand and the forehead. What goes there? The commandments of God. Couldn't be clearer, could it? The commandments of God are what are placed in the mind, and interestingly also in the hand. Do you know what the hand represents in the Bible? You know what the mind represents. Of course, your convictions, your beliefs, your actions are all represented by your hand. Sorry, that sentence was strung together a little bit. Convictions, beliefs, your actions are represented by your hand. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10. Now, Hebrews 8, we already saw, repeats this. So this isn't just for the Old Testament times. Hebrews 8 and verse, uh, I believe it was 10, says that the that the new covenant is for us to receive the commandments of God in our mind. It doesn't say frontlets between your eyes that time, but it says I will write them upon your mind and upon your heart. Deuteronomy 6, however, specifically lays out that hand and forehead analogy that's repeated in Revelation. 
Now let's dig into the commandments and we'll get a little clearer picture of where God's seal is actually found in the commandments. We know that the commandments, the very name of God or the character of God, the commandments are a transcript of his character, the commandments are a reflection of his character, and they're placed in our forehead as we receive a Christ-like character day by day. But what is the seal? What is a seal? You see pictures of a seal on the screen. In Bible times, a seal was something that was used to show that a law was valid. When the king passed a law, he would use his seal to validate the law, if you will, to show that it is based on his authority and legitimize the law. When King Ahab wanted his neighbor's vineyard, Queen Jezebel wrote a law declaring it to be his, her husband's property. And then what made this document official? It was never just. It's, it's a fraudulent law, of course. It's theft. But what made it uh, have force? It was the fact that it was sealed with the king's seal. Have you ever stopped to wonder why are God's Ten Commandments, why do they have force? Why are they substantive? Why are they real? Why are they authoritative from God? It says it in Revelation. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? You created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So why does God receive obedience? Because he's the creator. That's a very simple verse, but very profound and important. So an official seal typically would have three components to it. It would give the title of the ruler in question who is placing his stamp of authority on the law. The title, like king, emperor, pharaoh, Caesar, even president. The United States has a presidential seal. President. Also, it would include his territory over which he rules, his domain. And then thirdly, this isn't in our seal because we don't have a president's name because we're not a monarchy, but it would have his title, his territory, and his name. So it would say King Ahab, ruler of Israel. King Ahab, ruler of Israel. Name, name, title, territory. Maybe we'll find those three elements of an ancient seal in one of the commandments of the ten. This is fun. This is the fun part. You, you already know which commandment it's going to be because we read Revelation 4, verse 11, which says, what is God's authority as lawgiver? You created all things. Which commandment identifies God as creator? It's the fourth commandment. But also, in the fourth commandment, do you find the three elements of an ancient seal? That, that you're going to see the seal of God right here. Watch this. This is so fun. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. That's Yahweh, his name. Your God, that's Elohim, his title. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made, notice his territory, the heavens and the earth, the sea, where John is quoting in Revelation 14 saying, worship him according to this commandment. It doesn't take much. He's not being too subtle there. It's the longest quote of the book of the Old Testament in the entire book of Revelation. And he's saying, don't take the beast's mark. Worship God. Keep his commandments. And then he quotes from the fourth. Revelation 14 is all we need, but we got Deuteronomy saying it's the law of God in the forehead and the hand. We understand the components of an ancient seal. All the readers of the scriptures would have understood this. It was common knowledge at the time. And we go, wow, that is his sign between us. It's his seal in Revelation 7 and 14, which really is just an outward expression of our faith in him, right? Those who have the commandments of God have the faith of Jesus. It's not about the commandments. It's about Jesus. And they are his commandments, and it is his character. But the commandments are that test of loyalty for those walking in faith with Jesus Christ. And if you think about this, people might say, well, you're trying to get to heaven by your works if you delight in the Sabbath, as God has asked you to do. But nobody ever says that about thou shalt not murder, or thou shalt not have idols, or thou shalt not commit adultery. Like, really, Brother Scott, you're faithful to your wife? What are you trying to do, earn salvation in heaven through your works? No, I'm faithful to my wife because I love her and because God commanded it. 
it's not about earning. Why do we pick on the fourth commandment and make that, oh, you're being legalistic. Yeah, we'll keep all nine, but not that one. This is legalistic. That doesn't, that's not fair. It's not honest, is it? And similarly, when we think about it, the, um, when, when God says, keep the Sabbath, please, and I say, but God, I don't, I don't see the Sabbath. You know, I see stealing. I can't take an object. I, I get what an idol is. I understand what it means to misuse your name. These are kind of concrete, but this Sabbath thing, I, it takes a step of what? Faith. Of faith. That's why faith and commandments go hand in glove. So the Bible teaches that the seal of God is contained in the Sabbath commandment. God has a seal. Antichrist has a mark. Beast, the beast has a mark. God has a seal that goes here. The beast has a mark that goes here or here. And so God's seal is what sustains his authority. The beast's mark is going to be his claim to receive worship and authority. Do you see the dividing lines being laid down here? Now we can identify very simply what the beast's mark is because it's going to just be countering God's seal counterfeiting, if you will, counterfeiting God's seal. Now, I'm sure you already know just by this simple Bible study of what is the seal of God. But I would like, rather than for us to say it, I would rather have the Roman church say it. Catholic authority C.F. Thomas writes the following. Of course, the church claims that the change of the Sabbath was her act. And the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. That's, that says it, doesn't it? The Sabbath commandment contains the seal of God. Supposed Sunday sacredness is the Vatican's counterfeit of the fourth commandment, their mark of authority. And isn't it fitting that it's as simple as this? It's not some complex thing. It's not, it's not confusing. It's clear cut. It's simple. The Bible's authority, God's authority through the Bible, or man's authority through the church. Satan wanted worship and obedience, and this worship crisis comes straight down to this. Another Catholic publication we read, perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church ever did happened in the first century. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday. Not from any directions noted in the scripture, but from the church's sense of its own power. Yes, this is a Catholic source. People who think that the scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists. Thank you, by the way, Palm Harbor Seventh-day Adventist Church for hosting this meeting. I think you're on to something here. <laughs> Praise God for your faithfulness to all of the commandments of God. Small in number, but big in faith you are to God's glory. Growing in grace and growing the family. And in vain, many worship God. It's claiming to worship God. Like Herod said, I will worship Jesus. You liar. It's not true. Teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Do you see the connection between commandments and worship here? If it's the commandments of men, who are you worshiping? You are not worshiping God. It's vanity unto God. How could everybody get it all wrong so much for so long? Remember this question? Mm -hmm. Here's another way to think about that. When Jesus was at the cross, how many people were still standing beside him, supporting him? Not very many. His mother, John. How many got on the ark with Noah? We talked about that already. Only eight of the whole world. And I'm not trying to be pessimistic about the future, about numbers. I'm just saying, biblically, we should not be surprised that the whole world wondered after the beast. That's what it says is going to happen. Um, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It's serious. We read it in the third angel's message, and we were just like, whoa, that's a sober warning. I need to put less faith in myself and more faith in God. Did you ever notice that the Bible both starts and ends with a worship controversy? 
two different ways of worshiping God, one that is true and one that is false. Who am I thinking of in Genesis chapter 4? Cain and Abel. Cain was worshiping God, but his own way. Man's works. Abel was worshiping God with that sacrificial lamb pointing to Jesus as our righteousness. True worship. Cain, when he was cast out after killing Abel, God puts a mark on him. Isn't that interesting? The mark is about worship, isn't it? So what is the mark of the beast? It's not some literal object. It's if in my mind and convictions and beliefs, or in just the actions, whatsoever the hand find it to do, if I were to accept a change in God's holy moral law, because thus saith Lord God the Pope, I don't like that quote, but that's what's been said, or because everybody's doing it, if, if for any reason I say, I truly believe this, my eyes have played tricks on me, yes, sir, I will surrender my conscience and my reason, or if I'm just like, I got to eat, I'm sorry, I just, whatever, sure, yes, Caesar is Lord, Caesar is Lord. There were a lot of people in the Roman Empire that didn't really adore Caesar as Lord, but they went through the ritual to save their hide. It's happened throughout history. If through action or conviction one accepts the Vatican's authority, Papal Rome's authority and Sunday sacredness in the near future, that is the receiving of the mark of the beast. Uh, I Notice I said in the near future. This is sometimes a breather moment like, okay, that was intense and heavy what we just went through, but remember this, the mark of the beast crisis is when there is no buy, no sell, and death decrees coming down over the mark of the beast. So the mar there's no mark of the beast yet, if, literally, in the sense of has anybody received it? Now somebody could be living in rebellion against the fourth commandment and, and, and grieving away the Holy Spirit and cutting off the relationship between them and God because they're like, no, I don't want to obey you, I want to obey that guy. You, know, you can do that anytime and imperil your soul. But the time at which it is the defining, dividing issue, testing the loyalty and faith of people claiming to be Christian, that is yet future. Right now we can be receiving the seal of God. Nobody yet has the mark of the beast. Revelation 13 is clear that it's in the context of force that the mark of the beast is being applied. But I sure don't want to be deceived on this point. This is our chance in our time to warn the world with that third angel's message that it would go with force and authority to every heart and mind, the, the force of conviction upon the hearts and minds. What happens right after the warning of the mark of the beast? I won't turn there again, but remember Revelation 14. Basically, the third angel's message says, don't take the mark. If you do, it's not going to go well for you. And then right after that third angel's message goes out, Christ's coming in Revelation 14, to harvest the earth. So there's a short window of time. At the close of this message, and the mark of the beast crisis is often referred to, referred to as the close of probation, Daniel 12 refers to a time of trouble that is coming such as there never was since there was a nation. And, and, and the, the judgment that was set, they stand up. And there's no longer a judgment in heaven. Christ is getting ready to come again. He who is unrighteous, let him be unrighteous still. He who is unholy, let him be unholy still. Quoting again from Revelation. That period of time is coming soon. And the mark of the beast crisis is right around the corner from us. So to show it on the screen, worship the beast or worship him who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea. That's our choice. Worship was where my final allegiance points not to myself and preferences, not to my job, not to my church, not to my traditions, not to my family, not to my culture, not to anything other than Jesus Christ and his word alone. We, we who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Truth. I can't insist on worshiping God my way. That's not worship. That puts me in the position of God. Worship God his way, in truth. Not because he's demanding, angry. No, because he is so loving, I want to love him back with the worship due his name. I want to close with a, a story, an analogy, so that we get over this thing of, oh, it's just a day. 
It's just about a day. It's no big deal. Okay. Imagine someone standing on a street corner, and he's doing some, uh, something for people to see. He's got a bag, and he takes out of his bag a piece of cloth. And this piece of cloth is white. And he throws it on the ground in the grime of the cur under the curb and starts stomping on the white cloth and looking around like that. And people are like, well, that's strange behavior, but I'm not particularly offended by that. I'm moving on from this fella. But then he takes out a red cloth and does the same. Same thing. You're like, eh, okay, whatever. He does the same with a blue cloth stomps it into the dirt. Nobody's particularly offended by it still. They're just like, okay, that's strange. Well, he goes home and he, he cleans those cloths or gets some new white cloth, red cloth, blue cloth. He, he, he sews it together in one cloth this time. And in this cloth, he does it in the form of the white and the red and the blue being distinctly in a pattern that would be recognizable by people, he throws it on the ground and stomps on that. And do you think people are offended by that? Yeah. Of course they are, and rightly so. But it's, it's just cloth. It's just cloth. No, it means something. God's holy day is not just a day either. He says, please stop trampling on my holy day in Isaiah 58. Trampling on it. Get your foot off the Sabbath. Isn't that interesting? He says, it means something to me because it's a memorial of creation and of redemption, the two greatest events in history. So just simply love is all I ask. And it's a choice. I don't force. Because there will come laws enforcing Sunday observance at the behest of the papacy and his second beast, who we will study another time. And there will be laws about not buying or selling unless you have accepted this authority of Sunday sacredness. Again, I know that sounds kind of futuristic and outlandish and impossible, but if the Bible says it, I have to go with that. I can't say, well, this is what I think is going to happen based on current trends and trajectories. I'll just go with prophecy. That's a sure word of prophecy. And in 2019, if I would have said to you, one year from now, you're going to have half of the global population under house arrest. That happened. Lockdowns. That's prison terminology. If I would have told you in 2019, in 2020, half the world is going to be calling what they are under lockdowns. Prison terminology. The technical legal term is house arrest. Stay-at-home orders by governor edicts, or in other countries it wasn't governors, but if I would have told you that the majority of people's occupation and livelihood, the majority of workers would be called non-essential. That sounds more outlandish than this. That sounds crazy town. Like, how would you get half of the population to be like, oh yeah, sure, house arrest? We're all, we're all signed up for that. I'm on lockdown, okay. I'm non-essential? Okay. Yeah, it happened. So don't underestimate how the unexpected can happen. Who knows what kind of global crisis scenarios are going to set the precedent for enforcement of papal worship, but it will happen. So our closing thought, who do we love? Who will we serve? Who will we worship? Every soul will understand and decide. Every soul will have opportunity to see this truth and to decide. So as we've had opportunity, let, let our closing prayer be the lyrics of this beautiful gospel hymn. It says, O oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I am constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind me closer still to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it prone to leave the God I love. And then notice this part. Is this your prayer tonight? Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Father, that is our prayer to you. We trust that you are doing it even now as we seek you in worship and love. In Jesus' name, amen.
I'm going to